Hi, my name is Amy Haas, and I manage the WealthWorks Northwest program for Rural Development Initiatives. Hi, I'm Mallory Ray, Extension Community Economist at Oregon State University. We're excited to present this four-part video series called WealthWorks in Action. We adapted the material for these videos from community-based workshops. We hope they're a resource for anyone, but these videos have been designed for people who have a basic understanding of WealthWorks and are looking to apply this approach in their communities. Okay, let's get started. The four videos in this series include Introduction to WealthWorks, Selecting a Sector and Defining a Market Opportunity, Mapping and Analyzing a Value Chain, and Analyzing Market Demand. These videos explore topics that are interrelated, and we recommend that viewers watch them in the order presented here. For more detailed information about the overall WealthWorks approach, please see the WealthWorks.org website. Welcome to Mapping and Analyzing a Value Chain. Once you have narrowed your focus to a specific market opportunity, the next step is to map and analyze the value chain of that market opportunity. We will define a value chain, how to map it, and then how to use that map to find opportunities that can generate long-lasting benefits for your community. WealthWorks offers an inclusive, grassroots approach to economic development. In WealthWorks, we measure success through the achievement of three goals. First, building multiple forms of wealth that can create household and community benefits. Second, increasing local ownership and control of assets so wealth stays in the region. And third, improving livelihoods, particularly for people who are struggling to engage in the economy. The WealthWorks approach makes progress towards these goals by finding opportunities to develop a region's assets to meet a market demand. For example, juniper wood, which is overgrown in eastern Oregon, is being harvested to produce landscaping and building materials that are meeting a growing market demand for sustainable wood products. Products that are rooted in the local assets of a region are connected to markets that can be local, regional, or even global. WealthWorks engages a wide range of stakeholders to develop the linkages between local assets and markets, and this is where the concept of a value chain comes in. So what is a value chain? Many of you will be familiar with the concept of a supply chain. A supply chain is the set of operational steps to get a product from its original form to the customer and to do so efficiently and cheaply. For example, the supply chain for cheese starts with the cow on the farm, goes through processing and packaging steps, and ends with the product that consumers might buy in a store. A value chain is similarly focused on the set of steps to get a product from its original form to the customer, but is specifically focused on adding value at each step to meet customer demands. A WealthWorks value chain, like all value chains, is demand-driven, but aims to carry out these steps in a deliberate way to build value for communities in the form of local ownership, equity, and multiple forms of wealth. In many cases, this may go beyond what the private sector would do on its own. For example, it might mean forming a growers cooperative in order to aggregate product, and then developing a local brand to enhance marketing for small producers, or training local workers to carry out a service that would typically be outsourced. A group in New Hampshire is focused on developing the recreational tourism value chain. The stakeholders have made deliberate choices, including connecting local tourism businesses to energy efficient investments that can save them money. This has a positive impact on both the environment and the business's bottom line, while enabling them to use the savings to increase salaries for workers. Rural communities are making deliberate decisions about how to develop their value chains so that multiple forms of wealth are built in ways that benefit their target groups. Here is a diagram of a value chain. All of the boxes represent various tasks that have to happen for the value chain to be successful. There are many ways to diagram a value chain, but we have found this method to work well for most value chains. What we are aiming to do when we map the value chain is to identify all of the players in this system to see how they connect to one another and where they play a role in the overall process. We also want to be explicit about what values this effort is trying to build. This helps us to see where the problems or opportunities lie. So now I'll talk a little bit more about each specific part of the value chain. This work is guided by the shared values and wealth building goals of the value chain partners. 
Returning to these values as you map and analyze your value chain will help you decide who to partner with and how to focus your efforts. This row of boxes represents the core tasks of the value chain. That is, the main transactions that take place between supply and demand, or producer and customer. These include people, businesses, or organizations that play a direct role in sourcing, producing, distributing, and using the product or service. In the WealthWorks approach, these are called transactional partners. We have highlighted the demand task in a different color to emphasize its importance. This demand box represents the customer of the product or service. Customers may be end users, but may also be wholesalers or retail buyers. It's critical that the value chain is demand-driven, that is, that actual demand from customers has been clearly identified for a particular product, or else you risk wasting a lot of time and resources. Also keep in mind that you do not need to identify everyone who might potentially buy your product, but just a handful of key customers who you have confirmed are willing to buy your product and who you are going to develop a relationship with. Supporting tasks are not part of the main value chain, but are essential for the value chain to function. These might include related services such as equipment, supply and repair, transportation, storage, financial services, education and training, and the like. Rules and regulations include standards, regulations, laws, and informal rules and norms. Examples might include food safety regulations, certification requirements, tax codes, and cultural traditions or assumptions around gender and ethnicity in particular job roles. And finally, I want to talk about the coordinator role. With the WealthWorks approach, the coordinator serves as the backbone of a value chain. With multiple players and moving parts, this individual or group serves as the convener and connector who holds the big picture and weaves together the efforts of everyone involved to achieve the larger goals. Now that you know the different parts of the value chain, we will walk you through five steps to map and analyze a specific value chain. This process usually takes quite a bit of time and requires input and participation from a wide range of stakeholders. It can be carried out in a number of ways through a series of conversations, a large group work session, or by the coordinator who then checks in with other stakeholders. You want to ensure that your target group, that is the people you want most to benefit from this value chain work, are involved in the process so that you can understand the specific challenges they face in participating in or attempting to participate in the market. While we are representing this as a linear process, in reality, there will be quite a bit of jumping back and forth among the steps. Also, this is not a process you carry out just once and put aside. You will constantly be revisiting these steps as you develop your market opportunity. Okay, step one, identify and engage market players. The best way to do this is to talk to all of your local businesses and other stakeholders who you know who are involved in the value chain of focus. This will allow you to introduce your economic development initiative, identify the people who are most interested in being engaged, find out in a very preliminary way what challenges and opportunities businesses face, and who else you should be talking to. This step can happen through phone calls, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and group meetings. As you are talking to people, you will want to take an inventory of the players involved in the value chain. Start by documenting the end markets and be as detailed as you can. In the seafood value chain, an end market might be identified as a farm to table restaurant, as opposed to just restaurant. It is not important for you to do a comprehensive demand study for a product. What is essential is that you identify and get to know a few buyers who are interested in the products that you have to offer. For more guidance about demand, see the related video. Next, list the other players in the core chain who in some way add value to the product from the beginning of the chain to the end. After the core chain, list all of the support players that do not directly interact with the product but are essential to getting this product or service to market. Finally, list those related to the rules and regulations that influence the product or the service. The previous video in this series discussed identifying your target group and defining your goals for this work. 
Now that you have the opportunity to involve a wider circle of stakeholders in this conversation and to determine how the value chain can be developed to meet those goals. This step gets down to the nitty gritty of how value chains can build wealth in a way that benefits your community. The three overall wealth work goals can guide this conversation. In the seafood value chain, the overall goal may be to improve the well being of low income fishermen. But stakeholders might want to break this down into two sub goals one for small boat owners and another for crew members, since their situations might be quite different. So the goal might break down into increasing incomes for small fishing businesses and improve livelihood opportunities for crew members. For example, in the New Hampshire tourism initiative mentioned earlier, the initial goal was to improve well being for low wage tourism workers and local small businesses. When stakeholders got together, they made a deliberate decision that they did not want to increase the number of tourists, but rather to increase the amount of dollars tourists spend at local businesses. So the overall goal did not change, but how they develop the value chain will be influenced by this decision around changing tourist spending habits as opposed to drawing in more tourists. This process of thinking through the purpose of the value chain work will help lay a strong foundation for building multiple forms of wealth that can benefit individuals and the broader community. Now for step three, mapping the value chain. In this step, you are mapping the existing market conditions of your selected value chain. We will use seafood as an example to illustrate this process, and we'll draw from real experiences of groups working on the north coast and south coast of Oregon. For this example, we will focus on the dual goals of increasing incomes for small fishing businesses and improving livelihoods opportunities for crew members. Keep these goals in mind as we do our mapping. We will talk more about them in a minute. First, you will want to start with a simple flowchart that captures the main categories of players in the core chain. This will keep you organized as you do your mapping. For the seafood sector, we have identified five main tasks along the value chain. Fishing, aggregation, processing, distribution, and customer. I will also mention here that seafood is not one value chain, but many, such as shrimp, crab, salmon, halibut, etc. And each can have its own map. We have chosen to combine them in one map for this example, since the fishermen we work with catch a number of seafood products, and the pattern is similar across all of these products. As you determine what to map, aim to start with a tight focus. The best approach is to generally start with one product or service in order to gain an understanding of the value chain dynamics, and then you can add products or services and partners as they emerge. Now that a basic flowchart is in place, you can start mapping the market players from your inventory according to their roles. We will start with players from the core chain. We are focusing on small fishing businesses and their crew, so we will place them on the map under the fishing task. Then we can trace the path of the products all the way to the end users. Next, there are the large wholesalers and small local pro processors. These two types of value chain players then sell to a number of retail outlets who sell to a number of different end users. There are also some direct linkages between small fishing businesses and customers. And finally, there is bait that is sold from fishermen directly to other fishermen. Your diagrams will likely become messy quite quickly as you uncover all of the different pathways that products take and the many different players who touch it in one way or another. Next, you'll want to map the support players. Again, these will be mapped according to when they play a role along the flowchart. So for example, services that directly support fishermen will be at the beginning of the flowchart. Waste management, processing and equipment suppliers and transporters will participate further along. And cold storage and financial service institutions, for example, span most of the chain. Some of these players could be considered either part of the core chain or as support tasks, such as ice, bait and fuel, cold storage and transportation. Don't worry too much about what, ca what category things go in. Just get everybody included on the map so that you can start to see the big picture and how they all connect. And now rules and regulations. Here, map all of the players or rules and regulations that impact the value chain. Again, map them according to their place along the chain in which they occur. 
So for example, port fees occur at the beginning of the chain and food safety regulations occur all along the chain. When you put all of these pieces together, you end up with a diagram that might look something like this. You can now see where all of the support and regular, regulatory tasks correspond with the core tasks in the value chain. In some cases, you may even be constructing a new value chain for a product or service that does not currently exist. In that case, you can piece together the support providers and rules and regulations as you work on building out the actual chain. What we have shown is a very typical looking value chain, though simplified for the sake of time, and will work well for products such as food and agriculture products and manufactured goods. However, not all value chains will follow this pattern neatly or be quite so linear. Tourism is an example that may result in a map that looks more like a network than a chain. Tourists interact directly with a number of businesses and services, so to map a tourism value chain, you will likely need to map a collection of very short value chains that make up all of the services that a tourist needs. Nevertheless, the basic elements are the same. We can still break down the players into four categories used in the seafood example. Customers, the source of the demand, um, such as tourists and recreation clubs. Businesses that customers interact with, equivalent to the core chain. Support providers to businesses. And rules and regulations. Let's return to the seafood example. Now that we have developed the map, we can talk about how to use it to help understand challenges and opportunities and to develop solutions that will contribute to the two goals we have defined. As you have been researching the value chain, you have likely come across a variety of challenges that are preventing the value chain from growing or thriving. For example, there are gaps where a task in the value chain is needed to get a product to market but is not currently being filled by a business. An example from the seafood sector is cold storage. Small-scale fishermen currently have very little access to cold storage, which would enable them to aggregate their product until they have enough to fill a truck or hold it until prices increase. There are also gaps in marketing and distribution as well as financial and business development support for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Another gap in the seafood sector is access to fishing permits. This can prevent crew members from starting their own businesses and can prevent small businesses from expanding. You should also document opportunities on your value chain map. In our seafood example, opportunities might include direct sales to institutions or meeting an increasing demand for locally caught high quality products such as fresh Dungeness crab. Keep in mind that gaps often present opportunities for local businesses to expand or new businesses to emerge to fill a needed function. Now that you have identified challenges and opportunities, you need to decide where to focus your resources. In order to figure this out, you should research and compare the various challenges and opportunities you have identified. You should think about what gaps, if addressed, will have the most impact which ones will serve to help small fishing businesses earn more income, and which will help crew members to have improved livelihood opportunities. Perhaps accessing institutional markets might help businesses to sell more products, but if they are constrained by volume because of permit limitations, high value products that yield a better return for the same volume might be a better focus. For crew members, accessing loans and business support might be the most important factor for being able to start their own businesses. Or perhaps many crew members do not want to own their own businesses, but they need better access to health insurance. Their priorities should drive your focus. Another factor to think about with impact is leverage. In other words, which challenges, if addressed, will have the greatest ripple through the value chain positively affecting the other links in the chain and making it possible for everything to flow unimpeded. You also need to think about which gaps and opportunities are feasible to address. Is it something you have the capacity to do? And where is the excitement? What do people have the energy and excitement to address? You will likely need to focus in on a small number of these challenges and opportunities rather than taking on all of them. 
That said, many of them will be interlinked, so you may want to start with one, but then address others as you are able. You might also choose to achieve something small quickly to build enthusiasm and momentum and spark interest among more stakeholders. Now that you have narrowed your potential areas of focus, it is time to figure out solutions. To do this, investigate the underlying causes of the challenge, determine what stakeholders need to be involved, and then support these stakeholders to develop locally relevant solutions. You may end up with a number of problem-solving groups which are very engaged in their portion of the value chain and who rely on the coordinator to guide the whole picture. Finally, make decisions about how to address gaps based on your goals and the WealthWorks guiding principles. Now you're on to step five, revise and revisit. The process of mapping and analyzing value chains is iterative. Your understanding of the value chain will evolve over time as new information is collected and new people join in the process. So you will need to revisit these steps on a regular basis. We have seen some groups get stuck trying to gather a complete set of information for their value chain analysis before taking action, but markets are so complex and constantly changing, so you will never have a complete picture. So don't get stuck trying to make it perfect. This is simply a tool to help you make decisions and move forward. So keep it action-oriented, flexible, and be ready to act on opportunities as they arise. And remember that local businesses are at the core of this process. Filling the gaps with entrepreneurs and helping them overcome barriers is key. That is where you'll make progress. We hope the mapping and analysis process we have just explained will help you do just that, identify challenges and opportunities, and then help you to support businesses in ways that can benefit the whole community. You can find more resources related to this topic here and by exploring the wealthworks.org website. Thank you.